let's hear it for the University of Arizona filmmakers. I feel like that is not loud enough for the quality of incredible films that we just saw. Um, it is a huge honor to be uh, a, a member of the family, and um, uh, we are so blown away by all of these filmmakers. Again, one more round of applause for them. Please, let's get it going. Okay. So, my name is Shai Corman from the Friday Night Movie Podcast. This is my sister and co-host. Hello. My name is Becky. Hi. And we're going to bring to the stage... Um, three incredible filmmakers who saw their films just now uh, in, the, in the block that we just saw. Uh, first up, Roxana Denise Stevens Ibarra, Roxy, who made Tesoro. Yeah, oh, um, yeah here, come join right us. Like a, like a game show. And then, yeah, <laughs> we will be quizzing you on each other's favorite things. Next up, we have Sasha Rice, who did Changement or changement. 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 You know French. Come on. I mean, we grew up speaking French. I should have done that better. <laughs> and then we have Zach Lavorne who made Iris. And I was informed you were also the DP on The Lights Are On No One's Home. So, wow, that's co-DP. Co-DP, okay. Humble man. Well, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to do it just like our uh, show. We're going to ask a bunch of questions of the filmmakers. We're going to have a lot of fun. But when we come out on the road and we do the show, we also love a little audience participation. So if you have questions of these filmmakers, make yourself known. It's a little hard with the lights, so just wave, There's, raise your hand. We have, at, we at, have great people helping out here with yeah. extra mics. And, so. and at any point, uh, we may come to you, so just be ready. We're very improvisational. So we're going to have seat and we're gonna get going. Here all, we go. All right. Yeah, here we yeah. are. That's how we begin our, here our shows. Here we are at the South by Southwest Wonder House with the University of Arizona's incredible filmmakers. Uh, we have with us Roxy, Roxana, Denise, Steven Zibara, maker of Tesoro. We have Sasha Rice, who made Changement. And we have Zach Lavorne, who made Iris. First, we're going to just go around and ask you a couple of questions about your films, and then we're going to have some fun and ask you a little bit more of the family kitchen table vibe questions that okay. we ask uh, on our show. Because, you know, we're related as family. Okay. Roxy. First of all, I, I feel like another round of applause yeah, for your performance in the, in the film. Yeah, who also acted. Yeah. Which we had only met on Zoom beforehand, and so we were watching the we, film just now. We didn't. I don't think we made the connection when we when yeah, we had seen it the first. We've, we've seen so, the, the films before. So it's amazing. First time we had seen them. I changed my hair color a lot, so that might help. <laughs> that, might, that might be it. Okay, um, Roxy, your film, all the films that we saw just now, has such an incredible, beautiful use of music. I feel like the music really cues the emotion in the different scenes with. Uh, our 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 main character Gordo, right? Um, uh, and in the in the opening, and then all the way through to the end, it changes. Um, how did you use music as part of the storytelling in this in this film? So, um, coming from a dual degree background, um, having come from the Fred Fox School of Music with a Bachelor of Music and Music Education, with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Film and Television. I actually started with a music sound design um, background. So that's all I really wanted to do until my senior year when I got the opportunity to direct something. Um, and having done most of the post-production in COVID, actually, in my garage with my family, um, I ended up composing the entire you know, soundtrack, which is a lot of work, but really rewarding. And I am cringing now because I'm like, oh, I could have done that better. But um, I, I mean, we didn't pre-plan this. The first thing I wanted to talk about was the music. So clearly, yeah. you nailed it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, music's a big part of my life. Um, I'm actually <clears throat> still playing my violin, um, writing a new script about a violinist. So All right, that's wonderful. That's awesome. So, um, Sasha, you you also um, are. I mean, you're pursuing a dual degree as well in dance and in in film. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how you how you film dance, because we have these wonderful scenes of our subjects 
in their classes and if there's a particular approach you have to how you shoot dancers? Um, so actually, I my cinematographer and I worked really closely um, because I told him like there is kind of that like fine line that you're trying to find um, because. I feel like with like filmmakers and cinematographers, normally like you go for those really cool angles and like close-ups, versus the dancers are like you have to show the line, you have to make sure the line is shown. Versus when dancers normally they are so um, swept up in their actual choreography that they they forget that when it's on film it's a flat surface rather than the three dimension that you get um, uh, live. And so what I strive for and what I tried to communicate to Jackson, who did it beautifully, was that in between of letting film enhance the movement um, while still capturing the integrity of the dancing and the choreography. Um, so that's the like line that I go for. So trying to make sure that no movement that was, or like what the specific intention of the movement is not lost, but then like kind of like cutting out the things that don't matter as much within it, but then also experimenting with different angles and making sure that um, when it, you want to see the emotion, you see the emotion. When you want to see more of the body, that's what's shown. That, that is so awesome. Uh, all right, Zach. My first, I, so you're gonna get a two-parter, because my first question, like, did you hear me, and is it bad that I cheered when the eyeball gets him? <laughs> I wouldn't say it's necessarily bad, but maybe questionable. No, that, that was the second time seeing it, and I was so yeah. excited for the squish. The, yes. Ugh, the squish. For the, the sound effects, yeah. yeah. Um, I have a million, I mean, sound has been something that's so incredible, right, Becky, that mm -hmm. all of these films, ever, all of the ones on the block, just we kept saying, whoa, the sound is so perfect. Um, so we'll come back to sound later, because I really want to talk about world building. Gotcha. Because it feels like, even though this is taking place in a tiny room, mm -hmm. you, you've, built a, if you've built a universe, <laughs> and um, I would love to hear how you edit yourself to pick this one part of the universe to fit into a tiny mm -hmm. piece of film. Well, I think the first thing, the obvious thing is constraints and low budget. You know, the idea that like this was done for under a certain amount of money, you know, when we go into film school, we either have to, you know, do Indiegogo or have our own funding. But I think the constraint is what made it so powerful because I said, okay, I have one location and what story can I tell that's very engaging with one location, and I think that that's something that many filmmakers deal with, is the idea of like, how do I make small things feel big? And I think that that was part of the reason why I did it, because I wanted him to feel trapped in with this monster. Like, he's literally trapped, it's, it's the monster in the house, but he's trapped with him, and has to talk with him. And it's just so, I mean, just, Tense. I'm so tense when I think about the idea of this little little thing that could literally take over your brain in an instant. You have to treat it like it's a friend, you know. And I think that that is one of the reasons why I chose such a small area. I feel even more guilty for cheering for the squishing. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think we're we're cheering for the for the sound effects. Yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe you're cheering for the monster winning, but I'm I cheering just, for I'm, how amazing I'm those sound effects are. Cheering for how are. cool it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now I want to know what happens to him when he wakes up with the so green eyeballs. I'm, we'll get I'm to that. But actually, sequel. that is my next question for Roxy. Oh. Because, <laughs> Roxy, when we were getting to uh, know you all, we got that we got a, we got a chance, a little like VIP conversation in advance. It was a lot of fun. Uh, about a week ago, and Roxy, one of the things you talked about was wanting to uh, wanting to make your film sad, and and I hadn't seen it yet when we talked, and then I saw the film and I said, oh, oh I, I, it was a real it was a real like knife in my heart. But as I was getting excited to watch it again tonight, I had a feeling of optimism because I was I I saw one chapter close, but I was so interested to know. What's the next chapter of Tesoro in this era with the next owner? What kind of life is he going to see? What kind of adventure? So I want to put that question to you. Um, even with your commitment to sadness, what is the next chapter for the Tesoro? What things will, will, will it see with its new owner? Well, this is tentative, so I mean, I'm not going to overpromise or anything. Yeah, but yeah, we, well, you're not going to be helpful. <laughs> okay? you're not, uh, this is, we just want to get into your imagination and your world. Well, initially, I wanted to make the Soro as a part of a two film, two short film series, um, where the film, the car would end up getting transferred to this little kid, right? The kid who's asking for the car. 
Um, and the kid you see there is not necessarily the character that was supposed to um, get it. It was supposed to show the new generation of Tacuaches, mm. which I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's a regionally based Sonoran um, culture, car culture, so low riders and you know, tricking out these trucks and no quema, I don't know if you guys know what that means. But um, it's about these really car specific cultures that really like romanticize the era of um, Cesar Chavez. So transferring over the car is a really big deal. It's, it's almost like giving it to a child. So um, that multi-generational like story that we just saw was like just a little bite of like what I really wanted, um, I, I guess. I'm, I'm hoping that in the future, you know, eventually I'll come back to this project and really show what happens to the car. Wow, I love it. All right, another question for, for Sasha here. So I, I love the subjects in your films. They're so, they, how, how, did you, how did you find them? How did you choose them? Uh, tell us a little bit more about, about that behind the scenes. So I actually dance with both of them. Um, oh, wow. That's yeah, so cool. Kat is graduating this year. Um, I'm actually going to be dancing in their grad thesis piece. And then um, Madeline, who now goes by May, um, is uh, just graduated last year. Um, and I, I knew I wanted to do um, a doc that was centering a non-binary dancer's story. Um, and Kat just happened to start the university that year. And so like, how I started to know them was, I know that they were very, they were a big advocate. Um, they love telling their story. They love advocating for others. So I reached out to them and told them about this project, and they were instantly interested in, in it. And we've gotten a huge friendship because of that. And um, May, I danced with her for a couple of times, and I think we were just talking about queerness one day after rehearsal, as I do with a lot of queer people. It just happens. And I was like, actually, I'm making a film, and I would love for you to be a part of it. I also think it's so. Ins I also had heard that she had done men's class, and I thought that was a really it would be a nice twist to the film. But I was like, okay, I don't actually want, don't want you to just talk about it. I want you to be another subject in it. Um, so that's kind of how it came about. But they're both two very dear friends of mine. Um, and I think that's what made it, well, they're both like performers, so I think that's what made it them awesome subjects, is that they love to perform, but also like we were just kind of chatting when we were having our interviews, um, which made it a really fun process and it got a lot of emotion out. Definitely, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that is exactly what it, uh, what it was I'm gonna like geek out with Zach with one more question, but then if there are any audience questions, now's the time to raise your hand to our mic writers, and then I think Stephanie will flag me down. Uh, we will be back with the panel because in the in the next round, uh, you all are going to be our experts, right? Like our expert panel, because we're going to talk about all the films. Um, Zach, in your co-DP role, when lights are on, nobody's home, light, color, is used in so many different ways, everything from the wardrobe to the final shot in the, in the, in the empty room. And then in your film, you made one in, in black and white. Yes. What's what's that what's that decision process like? How do you how do you feel? Do you have a preference? Is there a reason why you do one versus the other? Well, with Iris, originally, shockingly, it was in color, and there was a part of me that thought about black and white, but I was like, that's a little too on the nose, you know, for Twilight Zone. But then I realized that the green of the eye served such an important role in the story. And I went to our professor and I said, hey, Professor Schuyler, um, just for narrative clarity, I'm thinking of going black and white. And I thought she was gonna you know, have things to say and opinions, but then she just looked at me and went, yes. <laughs> like instantly, and I went, okay. Right. So I went back and removed all the color. Uh, and so in terms of the difference between Faye's film and my film, it came down to her vision. Because when Martine and I, the co-cinematographer, it was me, Martin Samosa, and Joel Romero on the camera team, he called us and said, we just got, I just got Faye's script, and I need your guys' help because it is so dense and so beautiful, and there's so much happening. I really want to sit down with you guys and break it down how we're going to bring this to the screen. Um, and so it was a matter of not only communicating with her intensively in terms of the color, but when I went to shoot, 
I wasn't as privy to the settings he had and everything because he was unavailable for the next block of shooting. So I shot more neutral and I said to her, I just want to make sure that in post you can match what Martine did. And it was all about making sure, hey Faye, what colors do you want? <laughs> like what do you want to invoke in this and whatever you want, we will make it happen. So it was a difference in like making sure that the different visions came to life in the way that they should. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. No, no, I'm just, thank you. Yeah. Great, <laughs> wonderful. Now All right, any audience questions any yet? All right, start I cooking like, them, like, folks. Oh, I can see if I go like this. Mm. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna, we, on our show, uh, and then right before we head start up the next block, I think we're good on timing, right? Uh, we're gonna start up the All next right. block. We play a game. It's our unofficial ridiculous rating system, okay? Back Wait, in the 19... Where is this going? No, it was not going to... I know, just make... Oh, oh okay, we're doing... Okay, to, make sure we're not... Okay. Okay. Oh, by the way, we, we do we're argue. We're siblings, we have we, to argue. We, we argue. It's, it's fine, expected. don't worry. For the fans Very normal. in the audience, this is For what the they came to hear is us argue. We promise there will be more arguing in the next block. After, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, don't worry. <laughs> we, play, uh, we play this game. It's called Buy, Rent, and Met. It's the unofficial rating system, because back in the 1980s and 90s, anyone from the 1980s or 90s Anybody like, remember a video store? Remember, remember, who remembers video remember stores? Remember the pressure of deciding if you were going to spend the money to purchase a video, or were you just going to like go all the way down to the store and rent it? Still a very big effort, but it's only costing you a couple bucks. It's not, it's not such a heavy commitment. And then lastly... Meh. Now, meh is not necessarily negative. Meh it just means like, meh, I'm not interested, or meh, I've already seen it too many times, or meh, it's not included in my uh, streaming subscription, so I'm not going to make that. For, but so it doesn't, it's not like, we just, we really. There isn't like, a last place. Yeah, there so isn't a last place. We're going to play within each of your genres, okay? And we're going to give you each three films. you got to rank them by rent and meh. Now, for Roxy, if it's okay, can we go with car films? Because, okay, because. <laughs> Because of Tesoro, the car, and also everything you just told us about the potential sequel, I'm so excited. Okay. Okay. So, and if you haven't seen the movie, this works even better. Yeah, it's even funnier you just if you've never seen the movie. Judge it based on the title. Yeah, just judge it based on the title. <laughs> That's it. It's okay, so fun. number one, I'm going to go with the original Fast and the Furious. The first one. The first one. Okay, when they were just stealing when DVDs. They were <laughs> DVD players. Uh, DVD players. Okay. Then, um, uh, number two. I'm gonna go with, oh, this is really, this is actually real. Okay, then I'm gonna go with Mad Max Fury Road. I don't know if you've heard of, if you're a Mad Max so, Fury Road so fan. So the newest. The newest one. Of that one. Just All right, follow our timeline here. Keeps going, and then I'm gonna go old school. And I'm gonna be honest, this is not a movie I've seen, but I just, when I think of car movies, I think of Herbie the, Lug Bug, the Love Bug. Do you know that? With, I think there's one with Lindsay Lohan, it's probably the most recent one. It's a car that is alive and very friendly, I think. So how would you rank those three movies, by Rent, Rent and May? The first one, I'd shelve it in the back room. <laughs> Forever. Hot take. Serious so shade sorry. on Fast and the Furious. Right, no, that's, that's, going in that's, that's totally that's fine. fine. My parents fine. love action movies because it doesn't require a lot of translation. <laughs> so they just watch it for the boom and the bang and the, right. you know, and I, I just can't. I can't watch okay. them anymore. Okay, so that's your <laughs> myth. Um, the second one, Mad Max. The yeah. second one, I don't think I've seen it. Like the new one with well, the, with Charlie Theron. New, uh, we're pretty like old. No, the new old. was the like new. ten years ago, probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it just oh, came out. Uh, um, I watched like a part of the commercial. Uh, I'm gonna say, so I'll, I'll rent it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Herbie, I've also never seen it, but I like the Lindsay Lohan version, so I'd probably buy this one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> awesome. Thank you, that Roxy. You win, by the way. You've yeah. won the game. You've won the game. Um, all right, Sasha. Dance movies. Um, we we love dance <laughs> movies. I don't know if you love dance oh, yeah. movies, but we see all of them. All right. So um, we're going right, to, I'm not going to reveal our favorites, but let's just say in no particular order, um, center stage. Now, I don't know if you're, yeah, okay. Are you so familiar, you, with, are you familiar stage? with center stage? I feel like stage. your film goes well with center stage. <laughs> okay. I feel like. I, I feel like center stage sets you, like shoots it up, and then you spike the ball. No, yeah. So on ballet. And now we're going to go to the other end of the spectrum, <laughs> Black Swan. And then lastly, I was. I we debated. Of, we this. debated which it was, and okay, um, Step Up. Okay, 
So I'm going to buy Center Stage. That's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> dance, um, dance What You Feel. Dance What You Feel. Yes. Um, and I auditioned for SAB when I was younger, mm -hmm. um, which is like, that's what like it's based yeah. off of. And I remember like, I was like seven years old and I was like, oh my God, I'm auditioning for the Center Stage School. <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to say Rent, Step Up. They liked it. It was fine. Um, and then Black Swan, I refuse to see it until I end my dance career. Okay. Yeah, right. All right. I have actually I literally like I pulled the um, like a lot of times with like film assignments like they're like okay if you really can't see this movie if you have a problem with it like tell me and like we'll like we'll make yeah. up other arrangements. I've never had the need to do that like I'm okay with violence normally, but I got that assignment like freshman year of college and I was like yes I am not watching this movie. Yeah, Please I give me something I would else. say that <laughs> film speaks to the things that your film is you know calling attention to <laughs> quite a bit. All right. All right, Zach. <laughs> Should we just pick three Cronenberg films? <laughs> no. Oh, I mean, we could pick three Cronenberg right, films, well, but well, I, I, I will, okay. So I'm going to, so maybe we'll just go back and forth because okay. the, your genre is stuff. stuff. Well, okay, can I, can we do? You start I'll with one. Okay, so we got we to gotta pick a classic body horror here. Okay. So I'm going to go with The Fly. Gotcha. I'm going to go with a film that I think is maybe one of the most perfect films ever made, the original Alien theatrical cut. Not the director's cut. Beautiful. And then, and then lastly, I think, can, can, yeah, yeah, okay. and then and then last THX 1138. Okay. Which we picked that because you kind your film kind of gives us these THX oh. vibes. Wow, thank you very much. That's very. Mm. That's I'm George honored. Lucas's yeah. student film that became a feature wow. before he made Star Wars. I'm just curious. Yeah. <sighs> okay, I'm buying Alien. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, mean, you uh, can't go wrong. I feel yeah. like a lot of people leave that off their like horror lists because of the sci-fi element, but the the chain scene with all the chains oh, is yeah. just like completely mm. terrifying, um, which makes me love it even more. I think th it's going to be hard between the next two. Um, sorry, what was the third one? T so we had the fly THX. and THX. THX. I would rent. I, by the way, this is supposed to be hard. Yes. We, yes. we we didn't pick any garbage. Yes. We picked yes. all things that are yes, great. Exactly. You're, supposed, you're supposed to struggle. These are the top three on the mountain, right? Yeah, For all exactly. of your choices. I think just based on the things that I like to discuss in film, I think I would rent THX. Okay. And then okay. I would put the fly man. Very sad for me to put it there. But look, but our listen. parents probably agree because I remember in 1980 whatever uh, when they came mm -hmm. home and they told me all about it as like a seven year old child. Yes. Scared no. the living daylights still, out of me. Still makes me yeah. want to barf when I see it. <laughs> no. oh, it's all right. Insane. All right. Zach, Sasha, Roxy, we'll be back with you after the next block. You're going to be our analyst talking about all of the films that we've seen. Can we have a huge round of applause for these amazing <laughs> University Woo! of Arizona? Filmmakers. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be, uh, back. we'll be back after the next block. For more films. All right, how about a round of applause for our University of Arizona filmmakers? Before we bring our expert panel back to the stage, because this is this is the last time we're gonna be on the stage uh, uh, tonight. Um, uh, Becky and I wanna on behalf of us, but I think really on behalf of everyone say a huge thank you to the Wonder House team that have put on this incredible activation all week. A round of applause thank for, and, and specifically, because these are the folks that we, I know there's a lot of folks, but the folks that we've spent all of our time interacting with in the, in the in, since last year to, to this year, and in the weeks leading up to Misha Harrison, to Joe, to Chad Herzog, Stephanie, who's working with the production team. Karen. Karen from 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 the school from, from the, the from the, the, from the film school. Putting all these incredible films together. Oh, there's Karen. Are you Karen? There she oh, is. Oh, oh, hi. Uh, hi, Karen. No, that's. No. What's your uh, the rest of the production team? Oh, and the applause whole for them. Team. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we've had an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, week here. Um, we are now uh, going to bring up our expert panel of filmmakers. We're also going to be joined by Peter from Phil, Film Tucson. Peter? Peter. Ah, there's Peter. All right, Peter. Hey, hey. Hi. All right. It's so interesting when you see people in 3D as For opposed to 2D and zoom. zoom. Okay, All so right. first up, we're going to bring, um, well, Peter, you're going to sit here. So, Peter. Peter, please come join us. Peter, I got to. 
Catalanote? Catalanote. Peter Catalanote from Film Tucson. And then uh, I'll bring Roxy back to the stage. Roxy. Oh. Sasha. And Zach. A round of applause right. for these incredible, incredible filmmakers. All right. Okay, so. We're we, back. So we just saw another block of just phenomenal films. And I, I know when you're in film school, you have to, you know, you, you work on your you know, your classmates' films throughout the year, and you help each other out. You might be doing sound on one and might be DPing someone else's. So of the last block that we saw, assuming you didn't work on any of them, or if you did, you can't, you can't pick, you can't pick that you one that you on. might have Don't worked on if you worked on any of those. Uh, we would like to know which one of the ones we saw would you have liked to work on, and what would you have liked to have done on it? Because my answer is 100%, since I know you weren't asking me, Becky, but my Should answer I, is 100%. What, which one would you have liked to see, work this on? This is just like the show. No one ever asks no, me my opinion. No I just one, have to give it. Well, you talk enough, so at it's fine. The, <laughs> the opening of At 7, when, they, when they're trying to pull that kid's tooth out, um, uh, I offer my children all the time whenever they complain about a wiggly tooth that I would be happy to tie it to a string and yank it out. So I was I was so excited about that opening. I would love to be there, and that was an incredible. So you would have been the tooth moment. yanker. I would have been. The, I would have been. My job would have been tooth yanker, stunt coordinator. Stunt coordinator. Stunt for, coordinator. For, That's for more at seven. That would have right. been my role. But Zach, you want to go first? Okay. Um, I think honestly. The most recent film, uh, Seafood Tester, I actually knew Darius from his YouTube channel before I was even in college for like a while because he would make videos about filmmaking. And that's when I was kind of coming up and thinking about doing it as a career. And I get to the U of A and I go to check out some gear and he just walks up and I go, oh, <laughs> that's a great one. I didn't say anything because <laughs> obviously I don't. Yeah. I don't like it. interacting with people was difficult for me, but you're doing great up here. Thank yeah. you. Maybe you just need a crowd. Yeah, I, yeah, definitely. Right lights in your face yes. and a microphone and a lot of tension. And a lot of attention. That's, um, that's what was missing. But yeah, it, it was very surreal to be like, oh, this is the guy who taught me a lot about filmmaking in my free time. <laughs> and after seeing his film, especially again after all these years, it's just so powerful. And clearly, it's based on his life. And I would have loved to have helped him bring that to life in any way that I could. And I think he had such a great eye for the shots. I would have loved to have helped on the camera department because he shot through doorways. He used like the geography of his living space so well. And I would have loved to have been a part of that process. Awesome, thank you. Sasha. All right, All right Sasha. I think I would also say at seven because I, I mean, Harrison is just so adorable and so entertaining. <laughs> I would do anything on that set just to like follow around and be in that process. Like I could probably like I could just watch him just be him <laughs> for so long. Um, yeah, I think as Tatum mentioned, and I'm going to speak for Tatum for a second that um, in her Q and A after the film is that that's actually her um, cousin, um, and so that's why they had the close access. I think he's just so adorable, um, and so I would have loved to just do anything on that film. Awesome. Roxy. All right, Roxy. I would have really liked to work on the sound department in um, bookends. It reminds me a lot of Stephanie Silva's film style, and I really love Stephanie, so I would have probably loved to be on that set too. So that's Book great. Bookends was really cool, and bookends leads me right into my question. Yes. Go. Because I leaned over to Becky during bookends, and I said, "Wow, the acting, the young woman in bookings, like, blew us away." Mm -hmm. And. Uh, now, Sasha, you've worked with subjects, so it's maybe a little bit different. Um, uh, it's a little bit different, but I would love to know from all three of our filmmakers what your process as a director is working with the people that have to either give a performance or, or share their story with the okay, camera. I know you've never made a documentary film, but that's a very big part of it. Okay, all right. <laughs> Becky's it's like literally <laughs> what she has to do <laughs> is get people to share their story. Okay, okay, fair enough. I have not made. So yeah, anyone can start, but Sasha, you have the mic, so maybe okay. you want to start. Um, so for Shans Ma, um, I mean, with most documentaries, you usually do like a pre-talk with them. Um, but as I mentioned, they're like both of them are just so they're such open books. 
Um, so getting to sh them to share their story was very, very easy. Um, I think Kat like, has a tendency to go off tangents. Um, so, which actually was great because I think some of the most gem of like moments were because of like the tangents and that we were just like talking and like spinning off. So there'd be some times where I'd be like, okay, can we just go back to this one question? Um, but it, it truly like just became a conversation even with our interviews. Um, I'm also working on, or I'm almost done with my first short narrative film. So I can speak to that um, in terms I get very theatrical when I direct actors. Like, I, I like start doing it myself. Um, so, like, I guess me like acting it out and be like, okay, like you do it better. <laughs> it's kind of how, like how I go about it. Yeah. Um, in terms of working with my actors, um, in, when it comes to the direction, I definitely come in with a game plan in terms of what I'm looking for out of the performance. But I also make sure that after a couple takes of doing it the way that I'm thinking, I let them, I tell them, okay, I want you to do it. If you prepared anything, how would you do it? You know, this is the take to really like experiment with it because it's a process and you have to take it with, it's a journey with them that you have to take you and the actors on. And for example, um, Elizabeth Von Isser, who played his mother, just completely came in and absolutely nailed it. I didn't, there was a ton of stuff I didn't even have to say. She just like was on it and knew kind of what the role was. Like the, um, the head tilt before she says, why do you resist us? All her. She completely just did that first take. I'm like, okay, we're moving on. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's all about respecting them and what they bring to the role and making sure that you don't block out ideas that they have especially because some of their ideas can be the best moments. And I think that's why with actors, I always feel a need to make sure that they feel respected on set. That's, that's a really fabulous thing. Now, Roxy, you play both roles. And I, I just wanna say, I still am thinking, you, you're, you're a director and actor. The moment where you lean over to the car and you say, uh, uh, this is our car, or you refer to it as being like, you know, no. you know what I'm talking about, yeah. where you're, you're like you're claiming it. I, I just thought that was such uh, it's such a hypnotic moment. It's so playful and and sweet and I don't know. Yeah. I, love I, I, I I love it. So there, so you're a director. You're directing yourself. You're directing other people. How's that? How's that process? Um. So that was really weird. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. I was very challenged by doing that, especially as like a first time um, debut short film. You know, that was very difficult, but. Um, I think all in all is getting to know your actors and like hanging out on like a more personal basis and making sure you, you're getting to know each other's memories. And I think mem the power of memories are so important, especially when you channel them on set. So if you talk to a person and let's say like they're one of your co-actors or you know, you're directing someone new and they tell you about this time where like they felt like it was like the happiest day of their life when they were like 12 or something and you really want them to channel that emotion, you can bring up, remember when you told me about that, like show me how you felt. And you can really see their eyes light up or their moods change because you know, time is all a man-made construct and they can go back into the past and really bring that back. Wow, thank you. Thank you. One of the, oh, go, I was gonna, oh, I wanted to ask. I wanted to ask Peter. We're gonna ask Peter, we're okay. Wanna, we wanna start bringing we Peter We have to argue, it's part of our thing. Although, yeah. <laughs> I mean, argue. <laughs> um, so all of these films are shot in Arizona. It's in the wonderful state of Arizona. We have Tucson, Arizona. Yeah, specifically in Tucson. Very yeah, Very give it up for Tucson. In Tucson. In Tucson. And we have Peter here from Film Tucson. So um, what are some notable films? I mean, we see all these incredible student films. What are some notable films that have shot in Tucson or the surrounding areas that we should be talking about? Uh, well, Tucson has a, a long history of filming. Uh, most of the westerns you've seen that John Wade starred in uh, were shot in Tucson. We have a, a western town there that's very popular. Uh, most recently, we worked on a J.J. Abrams uh, pilot for HBO, which hasn't come out yet, called Duster. Uh, and then around the same time that was shooting, we assisted the locations team for uh, Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans, uh, the scenes where they're traveling across the desert. So we're used to working uh, with these bigger projects 
but we always love it when the U of A students call us and they're needing locations for their shoots because our feeling is we want to help them too because they're going to be the Steven Spielbergs of the future. Yeah. And we want to get Absolutely. in on the ground Definitely. floor. Uh, so it's really fun to help them when we get the first calls. Um, it's funny, we don't know what you're, we don't see a script, we don't know what it is they're filming. <laughs> so then when we see the final product, it's really fun because we didn't know what your story was and what, why you were needing this 1960s house or this, you know, whatever it is, a barrio. Uh, so it's really fun when the films come out and we get to experience it with the audience. That's great. And it, in, in Tucson, um, in, the, in, in, the, in the Tucson area, can you give us a sense of, right, because we're, we're Northeastern. We, we were raised in Canada. Tucson's probably about as far as you can get. It's diagonal from where, <laughs> where we grew up in Montreal. Uh, we immediately think desert, but there's more to Tucson than desert, right? Like, you can, you can there, there's more to that. I would love to hear a little bit about all of the, all the different places that yeah. people can film in in Tucson that are beyond the sort of the John Wayne town. Okay, got it. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever seen the, the musical Oklahoma, filmed in, I think, 1956. Not one bit of it was filmed in Oklahoma. It was all <laughs> filmed south of Tucson, uh, where we have these grasslands, these private ranch lands that look exactly like Oklahoma. So we have that look. Uh, we have this mountain. Uh, it's about 9,000 feet up called Mount Lemon. And at the top is a pine forest. Right now, it's covered in snow. So at the base, we have the Saguaro Desert, and then as you climb up, it turns, it's, it's almost like as if you're driving across uh, America. You go from Arizona to California to Oregon, and then at the top, you're at Seattle, and you're in this snowy pine forest. During the summer, it's nice and cool. So we, we have that look as well. Um, we, we also sort of have the look of the Middle East, um, maybe back in, I can't remember the year, 2005, uh, David O. Russell was making a film called Three Kings with I George Clooney. I love that movie. Love yeah, it's a great love movie. Love that movie. Uh, and uh, they ca uh, Warner Brothers was making that, and they came to us uh, looking for a place where they could build an Iraqi village. So we found them this desert with no vegetation, and they built this gigantic Iraqi village for that whole film. Wow, I could not wow, have guessed that that was filmed in the United that. States. Yeah, it was pretty places. cool. They That's didn't incredible. want to film it in Afghanistan, so they right. wanted someplace a little safer. <laughs> Uh, and then we have the look of Mexico, of course, because we're about an hour uh, uh, north of the border. Uh, we get a lot of calls for the look of Mexico. So uh, Steven Soderbergh's Traffic from 2000, mm -hmm. the scenes that were set in Tijuana were actually done in Nogales, which is just an hour south of us. So we can get the look of Mexico very easily. We can facilitate filming on both sides of the border. So we have all those kind of looks in one area. Um, can we have a huge round of applause for these amazing <laughs> University of Arizona <laughs> filmmakers? Thank you.